at Life Church, we believe that we all belong. We believe that we all belong. And yes, that even means that if you're in this place and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't know what you walked into, but here's this pushy lady trying to get you to know somebody that you don't, you don't know, you didn't come with. How dare she? But we believe that we all belong. And so if you are on a journey of faith, whatever that looks like, you are welcome here. You are so welcome. Can we just say, you're welcome here? Like, can you just, yeah. We are welcome here. And our great hope is that you will experience the grace, the love, and forgiveness of Jesus. That you'll make a decision to, to follow after him, to live your life for him, to accept him as your savior. That is our great hope. And that your life would have meaning and purpose the way that God always designed for it to be. That, that's that's basically it for here, for, for Life Church. Like, if we could get you to just understand the love and the hope that Jesus offers, and for you to walk in him and to know that you're not alone in that, I mean, that's, that's a great mission of a church, right? Well, if you're one of the newer folks here, um, for the first time, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Sharon. I am um, one of the co-pastors here of Life Church. And I serve alongside my husband, Pastor Tim. And uh, listen, you haven't seen his face for like six weeks. Is that weird? I thought I heard a no in there. <laughs> but he has been finishing up a really big, important assignment for his dissertation, for his doctoral work. And I, I have the microphone, so I'm going to share that you submitted it last week. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and don't you worry, you will be able to see his face again next week. He's going to be behind the pulpit again. I mean, he's, he's excited. He is, like, ready to be back here. He was, like, jumping up and down, playing bass today like he was 12 years old. Um, he's going to, you know, put some icy hot on his back later on. <laughs> But he is so excited to be back here with you um, to preach the word next week. But we have been, um, we've had the honor and the privilege to be in licensed ministry together for the last 19 years. 19 years! Like, we're adults, you know? <laughs> um, and we've been the pastors of, of this church. Well, it, I mean, it's a journey. It's a long story, right? There's a, it's a long story. But we've been here in this location, this building, pastoring this church for the last seven years. And it is one of the greatest joys of our life. It really is. Um, it's a gift to be here. And I'll tell you that um, I'm not going to get emotional yet. Hold it back. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I was just going to... Ron, you just like teed it up right there. I don't know. Is that how you play golf? I don't know. Um, but time truly flies. And thank you, Ron, for that segue because, yes, it is my 40th birthday today. I know, I know. I don't look 40. I, I agree with you. I don't. Um, but yeah, 40 years of life. Sheesh. I have been super reflective over the last year leading up to this big birthday. You know, like you do for big birthdays, it's like, oh my goodness, it's my last year in my 30s, and you're terrified? That was me yesterday. Um, but looking back on my life and the things that God has done, I've just really been reflecting over that. I was literally a, a high school girl, broken, uh, with a lot of baggage, that walked through those doors a high schooler that walked through those doors and, and sat in that back row right there where you guys are. Yeah, back row. <laughs> Represent. Um, but I sat like in, right in that spot, and that's where I met Jesus as a high schooler. And I just think about those things of how, how God has impacted my life over the last 40 years and has really set me up um, to experience all the things, all the things um, over the last 40 years. And when I was um, praying about what I wanted to share with uh, you all today and bring to you all today, I, I started to reflect on the number 40. And some of you are already laughing at me. 
But yes, I went and I, and I looked up uh, the number 40 in the Bible and all of those wonderful, glorious things that it talks about. Some of you are nodding your head like, oh, girl, that was cute. Because as much as I really wish that the number 40 represented, like, you know, something beautiful, like in Psalms or something, or like buckets full of wisdom, like Proverbs, right? No, no. Oh, no. No, no. Number 40 is uh, most associated with a time of testing and trials and uh, endurance to become more spiritually aware. I was like, come on. (laughs) Like, we can't just be forever 31. Like, forever Proverbs 31 woman. Like, that would be a really good Christian store, right, for women? Like, okay, we'll talk later about a business deal. But I don't think that it's a mistake that that number shows up so frequently the way that it does in Scripture. It's not a mistake. It's there to remind us of what John 16, 33 says. And it says, in the world you will have tribulation and distress and suffering, but be, crea- be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. For I, the Lord says, for I have overcome the world. And it's in Jesus that we have the ability to overcome, not necessarily um, be removed from the harsh realities of this world. Like, that would be great, right? If that was, like, written in there somehow in Scripture. It's not. We don't, we don't have the ability to be removed from the harsh realities that we face, but when we do face them, we know that we are more than conquerors of trials, tribulation, and suffering. I just want to take a quick poll here, okay? And I hope you're ready to be interactive because I am not a sit-and-get kind of person. You can feel free to talk. You can feel free to engage in this place with what you're hearing. You can feel free to say yes and amen to the things that you're receiving today. There's freedom in that. Um, But I want to take a quick poll. So I promise you are safe to answer honestly. Those of you online, put a hand emoji up. But I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when, um, when I recite something that you might identify with, okay? So how many of you over the last 12 months, okay, think over the last 12 months, a lot has happened. How many of you in the last 12 months have experienced something that brought you pain? Okay, keep your hands up. Discomfort. Someone's like, yes, again. Struggle. Worry. Hardship. Fear. Uncomfortable stretching. Okay, keep your hands up. That last year was rough. I want you to look around. Look around. Can you know in this place that you are not alone? And I am holding my hand up with you. You can put your hand down. But I am holding my hand up right now because beyond popular belief that some pastors are some kind of spiritual robots, that we become droids for the kingdom, which isn't the case, um, I, I don't need to go into detail, and you don't need to go into detail for us to agree that it has been rough, Right? It has not been easy. So then, going back to that scripture, if we know as believers, even as believers, we have been told that, yes, you will have trials and you will have hardship and you will face struggles in this world. Okay, we know that. And we also know on the other side that because we have Jesus, we are more than conquerors, right? We know those two things. Then there must be Tools, resources, and something good that comes from this journey. And I'm not talking about just on the other side, you know, where we're like, just on the other side of victory. No, I believe that we can experience victory right here where we are, right in the middle of this, whatever it is that you're going through on your journey. So I want to encourage you today, if you're not normally a note taker, take some notes. Get out your phone. 
Do not be distracted by the notifications because that easily happens, but I just believe that God is already saying something in this place today, and he wants to speak a word to you and maybe even have you speak a word to somebody else today to share the goodness that he is saying. So I want to encourage you to take notes because we are going to look at a particular journey of 40 years. And my hope is that whether you identify with this group, uh, you probably already know who I'm talking about if you have read the Bible at all, 40 years. My hope is that whether you have made choices, much like this group had made choices, that brought you onto a messy journey, or whether you have been grafted in to the unfortunate way of our broken world. Either way, whatever your journey looks like, my hope is that uh, you will know that this isn't the end of your story. That there is hope along the way. That's my great hope. So are you ready? Are you on this journey with me? All right, let's do this. Let's go. We're going to be talking about the people of Israel today. Oh, yes, those 40 years in the wilderness. What a joy. You will leave encouraged, I promise you that. But right now we got to identify and look at the people of Israel today. And we're going to hang out mostly in numbers, but I I want to start in Exodus. You hear of their journey a lot in the very first um, few books of the Bible, and um, that's where you're going to find numbers in Exodus right there. And I want to start in Exodus 13, verse 17, and it says this, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. I'm going to read that again, because I don't know if you caught that. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So many of you are familiar maybe with an animated film of this story. Who's seen it? Go ahead. If you really, I have. It's fine. That's good. It's actually a really good movie. Great music. Isn't it Whitney Houston part of that? When you believe? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Um, but you, you can imagine what, what is happening here. They've asked several times for Pharaoh to let him go, let them go, the people go, from slavery and bondage in e- Egypt. He finally agrees, and, he, and then God says, hold on, though. There is a quicker way, but I am actually going to lead you over this direction so that you, you won't get timid And you won't start to want to go back to where I'm delivering you from. So God actually leads them through the longer route, even just to escape Egypt. And most of you know how this portion ends. The sea parts, you know, like magically, like just uh, not magically. You know what I mean, those of you who are afraid of magic. I get it. But even cinematically, you cannot even fathom in your mind what this would look like the sea parting and them walking across dry land and them getting across just at the right time for Pharaoh and his homies coming through trying to pursue them and the Lord closes up the Red Sea and protects the people of Israel because although Pharaoh said yes I'm gonna let the people go he had a change of heart Anybody know, anybody familiar with this story? So the people of Israel are now free. They are on the shore. They are having a praise party. They are, I mean, Miriam, she has this like solo in in the the choir and she is singing praises to God. And they are all happy. They come upon pools of water and they're excited because they have fresh water and we're free. Well, it doesn't take long for somebody in the camp to realize that Chick-fil-A is always closed in the wilderness and they are hungry. They need some food. And they're like, hey, Moses, we're the struggle, struggle on Sundays every time. They say, hey, Moses, we're hungry. And the Lord then miraculously 
rains bread from heaven. Now, this is the part that I love because I'm like, bread from heaven? That sounds like heaven. Bring bread coming down and raining down, baguettes everywhere. It wasn't baguettes, but that sounds like heaven to me. However, the people return back to the cycle of going back and grumbling and complaining. And Moses has a whole group of people that are tap dancing on his last nerve. And him being a human, though a leader set apart by God, a human, he gets so frustrated that he ends up making some mistakes along the way that cost him greatly. So even Moses is frustrated and gets into that cycle of um, frustration and disappointment. And at this point, the things in the, the, the time in the uh, wilderness looks like a roller coaster. They are going up and down. They get a high and then they get a low. And then they're like, oh, we're excited because God provided this and we remember what he did. And then, oh, but this. And don't you remember what it was, what it was like in Egypt? And then they remember, no, we were slaves. We, are, we have been set free. And they come back up on the roller coaster and then they go back down. And it's just, it's just this roller coaster. And Moses finally goes up to Mount Sinai, and he comes back, and he's like, okay, look, here's the Ten Commandments. Like, here, you want instructions to live. This is what God has provided so that we actually know which way we can follow. And it's a beautiful, beautiful moment. However, it's time to now pack up and go on to the next leg of the journey. And there are more bumps in the road ahead. Have you ever been on a road trip? Did you have fun every moment of that trip? Did your kids have fun every moment of that road trip? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And and this moment for the people of Israel gets to the point where they are so fed up that rebellion starts to come into the camp. And the rebellion is woven throughout Exodus, but also numbers. And so I just want to break it down right now. It might be a little bit of a small font, but it goes a little something like this. And the people complained about their hardships. And the rabble among them had greedy desires and said, who will give us meat? Sometimes I ask that same question. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. And all the community raised their voice and grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And Korah and Nathan and Abiram, with 250 leaders of the community, rose up against Moses. And the entire community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Now each one of these things that I just pulled out from scripture is part of a separate event. This is like how often they went on that cycle of disappointment and grumbling. And at this point, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get to this point in scripture, when I'm doing my Bible reading, I'm like, come on, you guys, right? Like, get it together. Do you not remember like you walked through the sea? Like, do you not remember that? Or some of us might be looking at this like, well, certainly I would not have complained or grumbled. I would have been just fine with manna every day, day after day. Thank you, Lord. I am blessed and highly favored. But we get like this, don't we? But we we have to turn our vantage point this morning from looking at the Israelites like a character in the story Two, reflecting and looking at our lives and our journey. And this is where we're going to get personal. Because I have to tell you, I I think we can take a lesson here today. And I don't think the people of Israel were necessarily bad people. And what we find in times of uncertainty is this human condition that will go and and latch onto something when we are out of control. And we see that with the people of Israel. And I think we can take a personal lesson from this today. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 
and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So I don't want to read a story about the people of Israel just as a story about the people of Israel. I want to take a moment and look at these portions of Scripture, not in judgment, but in reflection of what God might show us today. And we need to hold up the mirror and examine ourselves because there is something about the human heart, the fickle condition that we find ourselves in that I think we can learn a lesson from. And then I think 40 years, there were generations that were raised up in rebellion. And I think for us today, we have an opportunity to break the cycle of a repetitive, of rebellion, of disappointment, of frustration with God and with each other, and find ourselves in this narrative. So let's look at it again. Different translation. But it says this, The people fell to grumbling over their hard life, and God heard. The misfits among the people had a craving, and as soon as, th- as, soon as they had... They had the people of Israel whining. Why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it for free. To say nothing of the cucumbers and melons, the leeks and the onions and garlic. Wow, slavery does and bondage does sound like a good deal, doesn't it? But nothing tastes good out here. All we get is manna, manna, manna. Miriam and Aaron talked against Moses behind his back. The whole community was in uproar, wailing all night long, and the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The entire community was in on it. 250 leaders of the congregation of Israel, prominent men with positions in the council, they came as a group and confronted Moses and Aaron. Grumbling broke out the next day in the community of Israel, grumbling against Moses and Aaron. They attacked Moses. The people became irritable and cross as they traveled, and they spoke out against God and Moses. It feels a little different when I put myself in the narrative. It feels a little different different when I examine the state of our world. But we get like this. We lack the ability to be patient I mean, patience is a fruit of the Spirit, but who has time to develop patience, right? We take matters into our own hands. We get exhausted from it all, and we hide from community. I'm not going to have you raise your hands on these ones, okay? We vent our frustrations with those who cannot help us. We lash out. We isolate ourselves into our mental mess. And we start getting enticed by the enemy's lies, and eventually we lose hope. And I think above it all, we fail to remember who God is and what he has said, what he has promised, what his character is, we forget. So when Tim and I were preparing to have Hannah, I was super pregnant, man. I was pregnant everywhere. But anyway... (laughs) <laughs> glad those days are over. Um, we, took, we took the birthing class, and I felt super prepared, right? I took notes. I had my binder. Okay, they didn't give out binders. I made my own binder, okay? This is my birthing plan. And I even informed everybody what I wanted after, after I gave birth. You want to know what it was? A McDonald's high C. That's what I wanted. Don't judge me. That's what I want. Thank you, Mark. You're nodding your head. Like, that's what you would choose, right? That is what I wanted. But more importantly than that, I had the information from the experts, right? I knew the methods that they had recommended. And I took it really seriously because I had a, an internal issue that, um, that, that made complications um, highly likely within uh, pregnancy and giving birth. And so I was high risk. So they saw me every single week, which I didn't mind because I loved getting new pictures of Hannah all the time. Um, But uh, I was following every part of the plan. Well, when the time came and I had that bundle of joy, 
things started to go wrong. Things started to happen out of my control. I developed a very high fever that started to affect her heart. And things just got really, really chaotic really fast, even though I was in labor for 24 hours. And I'll tell you what what got thrown out the window the moment that happened. Know what it was? My plan. My plan was thrown out the window because I was in a moment of chaos and my instinct was to grab onto the thing that was going to bring me relief in the moment. That means the breathing techniques went out the window. I was in too much pain. I can't focus on my breathing. I'm in pain and I am sweating from a fever and it was awful. Um, Not beautiful like they portrayed in the movies and everybody has good hair. I was panicking, and so I was grabbing onto everything that would bring me comfort in that moment and in that situation, not what would have helped me in the long run. Those breathing techniques would have helped me in the long run. It would have reduced the heart rate issues that Hannah and I were having. But we do this, don't we? We acknowledge, okay, you're going out on your journey. We acknowledge, God, you are good and faithful. We did this with Tim's program when he started this three years ago with his dissertation. We're like, we are so excited. We have all of our supplies. We have the syllabus. And God, you are faithful, right? And we were super excited. And then when you start getting on that journey and your high expectations are not accurate or in alignment to the realities of your situation, what do we do? We start to get disappointed and we start to complain and we start to get exhausted when things get hard. We stress out. And when other people appear to be winning on their journey and I'm over here on the sidelines, oh, you better believe that is frustrating, right? When you've been running year after year, decade after decade, and you're exhausted, and so we throw out the plan of the expert, and we complain, and we hide, and we fear. And friends, in all honesty, if whatever, you might be personalizing this right now, but if you even look at the state of the world, our present circumstances in our world, we are all exhausted and disappointed. And now we get a a lovely halftime show at the Super Bowl that gives us a glimpse of a better time, right? Nobody's saying yes to that. I know all of you. (laughs) That 90s music. That's our childhood, I guess. But we say, I miss, have you said this? I miss the good old days during the last two years. I miss when things were a simpler time. And we ignore that there were issues back there as well. But we do this, and the people of Israel were the same way. They begged. They begged Moses to go back to Egypt. They said, we would rather have slavery than what we have right here. And for people of faith, like you all in this room, this is the point of the journey where disappointment comes in and people begin to walk away from the faith altogether. They don't think of the miracle back when they first met Jesus and had an encounter with him, right? You know your story of when you first met Jesus? It gets a little fuzzy through the years, through trials and circumstances and things like that, right? But they completely disregard the miracle The people of Israel had food insecurity, lack of water, they had enemies, they had an uncertain future, and they started to forget of what God had done just two years before when they were on the shore singing praises and glorifying the Lord. Two years. Interesting. Interesting timing. But we have grand expectations when it comes to faith, and when those don't appear to be met that we, the way that we had anticipated, we lose heart. And I want to just say this. I understand that there are many people in here that are walking very real, hard journeys. And you are facing realities that are insurmountable on your own. So I just have to say that because we all raised our hands up earlier. And some of us, those things we've overcome 
in the last 12 months, but there are some of you that are still walking in those realities today, and I just want to acknowledge that. So what do we do with this, right? You're like, okay, stop talking about how hard it is. We know we're living it, right? The lesson that we can take today is that we have to remember. We have to remember who God has been for us. These are stories of honest portrayal of who God is and how we relate to God in the midst of our difficulties and our circumstances. And remembering doesn't mean that um, there are not the present real. Like, doesn't mean that you're you're coming out of reality and into something complete, a whole different world that you've created in your own. Right. That would be optimism. Optimism is that self-help trick, right? When you're like, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. We're all in this together. Everything's going to be great. Hope, however, hope is that God is with us and that all will be made well because God is with us. And that's, that's where hope is such a different concept. Hope is really fascinating, actually. Hope is that God is with us through whatever suffering we face and good will come of it in the end. But that's the point there, is that in the end, it's not a calendar date. We got to come to grips with that, guys. I, I told Tim this, like, throughout the three years, I think, of his journey. <laughs> if we could just get to such and such, then we'll be fine. Have you ever said something like that, even recently? If I could just get to the end of February, then we'll be fine. If I could just get to the end of this year and start over again, then we'll be fine. Hope is not a calendar date. It's the end where we see the return of Jesus. It is a very different metric system. And when you come to grips with that reality and that, our expectations start to change. And our hope is now our expectation and no longer our timetable. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So I think hope starts with accepting the realities of our life, the pain of our life. We're mortal. Can I just tell? I'm sorry. I have to be the bearer of bad news. You are mortal. You are fragile. You are living through a crazy time of this world. Well, you already knew that one. We could die. Life is really hard. Like, and saying those things and the realities of them does not bring a lack of faith but it is a reality of our present state. And when we find ourselves in the realities and then we can fix our eyes on God who said, I will be with you and I will sustain you because I have overcome the world, that is where we find strength for the journey. So I struggled if I was going to share this, but um, if I'm not honest about my journey, how can I expect you to be with yours? And if I do not testify my hope, how can I expect you to testify your hope? So can I be vulnerable today and transparent with you all today? Okay. I'm going to try real hard. This past October, I think the weight of all of the uncertainty of this world, um, came crashing down on me. Actually, I think it built up to the brim and then started like spilling over. That's the more accurate picture. Um, I wasn't doing anything uh, in particular other than checking my email, which I know is really dangerous. (laughs) (laughs) But I was checking my email. And email had become a real pain point for me and for Tim uh, because we had received lots of um, horrifying emails um, over the last two years. 
painful emails over the last two years, a lot submitted through our website that had no name attached to them. And I was doing a random task, and I read the subject line of this particular email. And it said, people are leaving your church. That's all that it said. It's actually not the worst subject line we've ever read um, for an email that's come in. Um, I'm sure that there was more in the email. I really couldn't tell you. And I literally couldn't tell you because um, minutes later, um, Tim was standing next to me yelling, Sharon, you're scaring me. Are you okay? Because I had fallen and hit my head and bruised up the side of my body from the level of stress that we were living under over the last two years, maybe more. I had collapsed on the floor. Has anybody ever collapsed in grief before? Do you know what that's like? Just feeling the pain, it's not anger. It's sadness, collapsing from the sadness and the, the hurt and the pain. And I'll tell you what I wasn't doing in that moment. I wasn't looking for the inspirational quote that I found on Pinterest. I wasn't reaching out for that. I wasn't trying to find some false optimism like, you're going to be okay, Sharon. No, in that moment, I was clearly not okay. What I was doing was I was shouting out to God, saying, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I cannot carry this on my own. I was never meant to carry this on my own, so I need you to show up, God. And as I started to get real honest with the Lord, real honest with where I was, I could hear him reminding me, of his faithfulness, that he saw me, that he was with me right there on the floor. And I finally found the strength to stand back up on my feet. Tim had to help me, but he's a gift from the Lord. And it was that day that I had to change from being an optimist, because I'll tell you what, through the last two years, I was saying, it's okay, we're going to be fine. We're in this together, guys. And if anybody of you who know me, I am a complete optimist. And I will tell you all the things to make you feel warm and fuzzy because I feel like I want you to be warm and fuzzy. But in that moment, I couldn't do that anymore. I had to come to the, the realities, right? I had to come face to face with the realities of what I was carrying. And that I couldn't get healed on my own. I needed him to come in and refine some places that were broken, right? Of, of even some things that I chose. And that's the thing, too, is that we have to come to the place where we recognize that there are some places in us that have to get cleaned out, no matter how, how painful we feel, right? And you have to let God do that in that moment. But I also, I also reached out to people who I knew understood, community, which was really hard for me because a lot of people had looked at Tim and I and said, hey, you guys are doing it. How are you guys doing this? Like, how are you getting through? And we're just like, God is faithful, and he is. Don't get me wrong. God is faithful, and I will continue to say that. He is faithful over your circumstance, over mine, over the world's circumstance. He is faithful. But I had to reach out and say, you know what? We're not okay. Let me tell you what just happened. And at first they were like, oh my gosh, do you need, a, do you need to go get a CT or something and make sure that you're okay physically? And then they started to speak words, reminding me of the faithfulness of God. When I couldn't remember all the things, and that wasn't from me hitting my head, <laughs> but when I couldn't remember the things they came in and reminded me of what I knew to be true. And at moments, I would get mad and angry. What? What do you mean? I don't feel his faithfulness right now. 
I'm not seeing all of the things that I want to see in my own picture-perfect world, right? The things that I expected to happen. And they had to remind me, no, Sharon, he's with you. Just as he was with the Israelites, his presence went with them. His presence went before them. And even with them having the ability to see that, they still had trials and situations and circumstances that were disheartening. His presence went with them. His provision went with them. The community as a whole went with them. There is something about a shared experience, right? Like when you're like, oh my goodness, you too? Like you're struggling too? Oh, I can breathe because I know that I'm not alone, right? And that's the beautiful thing that God had provided with the people of Israel. We got to recognize that in each other. You were never meant to walk alone. And also that he provided for the people of Israel along the way. You know that bread from heaven. But also the wisdom along the way that they desperately needed in order to remain on the trail. Friends, it's those places where we have to remember who God is and we have to hope in what he has said he will be with us on the journey. Amen? Can you think of ways that God has shown himself faithful to you? Are you thinking of them right now? I know that it's hard. I know that situations are really hard. But can you think of ways where he has shown himself faithful time and time again? Or maybe there's a scripture that you have been literally hanging on for a lifetime. That you're like, man, if I could see that in my present reality, I will hold on to that until I do. And for a lot of us, it's that he's coming back. (laughs) That is something to hang on to and be reminded of. But maybe the way God has come through for you is simply by being here today. What a gift. And it's not because of my words, but I feel like we're, we're having a, a, a little bit of a healing moment right here of remembering the faithfulness of God. Or maybe you're seeing hope for the first time in your circumstance. We have a, a family motto um, with the Lees. And I don't even know, actually Hannah brought this up today. We don't even know how long this has been our family motto. It feels like it always has been. Um, maybe you've heard it, uh, say it before. Oh, it's actually on my, on my tattoo. But it's, let's keep walking. And it's a commitment to ourselves. It's a commitment to each other that we're going to keep going forward and we're going to do it together. And it's also a commitment to God. Because, you know, he's in on that let's. Like, God, we're not going unless you go with us. Or unless we're, we're under that covering and we're, we're being led completely by you. And we have said this, some of the most difficult challenges, where we have had to remind each other around our kitchen table or around our kitchen island, hey, let's keep walking. It's okay, we can cry about it and we can hug each other, but let's keep walking forward. And I promise you there were times when we didn't want to journey ahead. <laughs> And I'm sure there, there will be times in the future because that's just the way our world is and our life is, right? But when we're honest with each other and with God about our present realities and when we remember who he is and have hope for who he is, that's when we find the strength to keep walking. Every year for my birthday, I like to do something, um, I don't know, it's probably silly, um, but I like to do something that's associated with a number. And I was really struggling this year because I actually wanted to do like a, a cool bucket list, like do 40 things by age 40. And like, well, you all heard what happened in October. I was not thinking about a bucket list at all. I was just trying to survive. And so um, I hadn't planned out anything really cutesy or anything like that to bless somebody. But I knew that I was preaching today. And I knew that 40 would be a part of the association of this topic, of this sermon. And so I hope you'll 
like join me in, in a little activity, a little exercise today that is going to be a part of that. Is that okay? Can everybody be a part of something today like this? And it's not because it's my birthday, but it's because I want to invite you um, to remember and to have hope and to be reminded that there's strength on the journey. That's all. That is my hope for today. So I want to invite you to get into, okay, you're going to stretch, okay? I know you have your people, but I want to invite you to get into groups of five people or less. Don't do it yet. But you're going to get into groups of five people or less, and preferably those who didn't come with you, but I understand if you got your boo and you want to be comfortable and whatever, um, or your bestie, sorry, boo or bestie, either one. Um, But I want you to get into this group, and what I'd really love for you to do is I would love for you to maybe bring a phrase or a word of how you are going to remember who God is right where you are right now. And maybe you don't feel super eloquent. That's fine. I'll tell you, it probably doesn't look like it right now, but I, I tell myself all the time, I don't feel eloquent. I don't feel eloquent. I know that I can speak, but I don't feel eloquent. Being eloquent or coming up with some beautiful word, take the pressure off, okay? What we're doing is we're sharing Um, what we are going to do on our journey. And maybe for you, that's just, I'm just going to remember. Maybe for you, it's just, I'm going to have hope. Maybe it's uh, provision. Like, I'm going to remember that he is my provider. Maybe it's, I'm going to remember that I am not alone on this journey. And what I want you to do is, you're going to have a a person in your group who is going to come up. You didn't know you were coming to a workshop today, did you? Ha ha. But what you're going to do is have uh, somebody from your group come up and get enough pairs of socks. I know they're huge. They'll be like knee highs or something. Um, Get a pair of socks um, for everybody in your group, and there's also some Sharpies. And what I want you to do is I just want you to write somewhere on on these socks the words that you're saying you're going to remember. And what I want to do... Uh, for you in this is that when you put these on, you'll remember to let's keep walking. You'll remember that there's strength for the journey. You'll remember that God is faithful and he is good. Maybe you'll put these on when you're doing your Bible reading. Maybe you'll put these on when you're praying. Maybe you'll put these on today. I don't know. They don't, listen, you don't have to be cute, okay? Like you can put them all the way up here, but write it wherever you want to. And then I want to encourage you an additional step if you feel comfortable because you're in a group, maybe you need to give your socks to another person. Maybe they need to be reminded with the word that you're reminding yourself today. Okay? So that's what we're going to do with our t- the rest of our time this morning. I want to pray for you. And then online family, I'm going to have some instructions for you online. Um, but I want to pray for you. Do not leave this room yet. We're not done. Stay here. But um, have somebody come and get your socks and a marker. And we're going to do this exercise today. God, I thank you so much for this church family. I thank you, Lord, that we're not alone on the journey. Lord, I thank you that we can remember who you are and we can have hope and strength for the journey ahead. And we do not have to deny the present realities that we're facing and how excruciatingly hard that they are, Lord, but we can be reminded that you have given us tools on the journey so that we can continue to walk forward. So I pray right now, Lord, that you would put a word on your people's hearts today, Lord. Remind them of your goodness. Remind them of your faithfulness, Lord, so that they can keep walking and possibly even share that with a friend today. So thank you, Lord. We praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. All right, would you gather in your groups and get somebody who you're going to say, hey, you're going to go and get all the materials, and then, you know. Those of you who are online... I am so grateful for you. 
I am so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you are engaging with the word. What I want you to do right now with the community that's gathered online is I want you to be brave. I want you to take a moment on the chat, and I want you to start writing in there the way that you are going to remember who God is in the middle of your journey and why that matters to you. So be brave. Be bold today. You're going to encourage somebody and strengthen somebody on the journey today. So I encourage you to engage there. You have Stan Bogomil back there who is um, the moderator. He is amazing, and he is going to just uh, be in community with you right now. So go ahead and do that and share. All right, let me, let me do the really hard thing and see if I can draw all of your attention back in this area over here. Hey. Hi. Hi to our online family. I was looking at some of your comments as well. Thank you so much. We're honored that you would share your heart with us as well. And we know you don't have a pair of socks that you, uh, that, that Sharon gave you to write on today, but what you wrote in the comment matters. Maybe even screenshot that or write that down somewhere. Maybe you have a pair of socks you just want to write on your own socks at home. Or if you need to swing by the the church at some point this week and grab a pair, we've got an extra pair for you. But online family, we love you. We're walking with you as well. Uh, As we are wrapping up, can we take a moment and seal this moment here in a word of prayer? Can we do that together? God, we say thank you again one more time for the community that just happened in this space, the ministry that just happened in this space. We thank you, Lord, for the word that was preached today. We pray a blessing on Pastor Sharon, and we are so thankful for her voice in our family. Just as one person even said in the in the comments on YouTube today, what a gift it is when Sharon preaches because her heart for you and for your people is just so evident and such a blessing. And so we say thank you for Sharon and for the message that she gave and the, the encouragement that she gave us today. But Lord, more than just the words that came through the mouth of a person, we know that your Holy Spirit was speaking to us today. And so we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the reminder that you see us when we can't see the way forward and that you are our hope when we don't feel like we have anything else to hold on to. So Lord, let Let this word resonate, stay, stick in our minds and in our hearts even after today. We thank you for it. Thank you for the connections that we just made. And Lord, maybe even friendships would begin to germinate out of this moment and this kind of rhythm of doing life together. Help us to continue to keep on walking together as a church. And in doing that walking, we will remember the hope that you've given us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you say thank you to Sharon for that great sermon that she brought for us today?